Okay, good morning. morning. I have a confession to make. Confess away. We're eager. I thought I thought that we were going to be done with in two in two weeks. And then it turned out that I have one more lesson in this chapter. You know, it's always the final wrap up that like is is always the problem. You know, you want to you want to get through it really fast. What Willie B does this all the time. You want to get through it really fast. You find a couple of notations and then you're like, you know what? I, I can't. I can't do this. I try and I, I can't. I can't. I can't do it. So um, we'll have seven parts to this chapter. Um, so let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start here. Lord, thank you uh, for your word. Your word is indeed true, and, and, and it is incredible that we can dig and look through your text and, and look at features and details and uh, just, uh, just have clarity when it comes to what you've communicated to us. We thank you, Lord, for the future because this concerns us as believers in Christ and our ultimate destination of where we will be and what it will be like. Um, we thank you, Lord, for John and his intentionality to write these things in detail and to communicate this by inspiration of your spirit. Pray, Lord, that this would be instructive and productive and that overall, Lord, you would be glorified. We love you so much and we give you praise for what you've revealed to us and what you continue to do for us, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and hit it. We have been going through chapter 21 and 22. These, uh, these chapters work together um, concerning the new heavens, the new earth, the capital city, the new Jerusalem. Everything is brand new, right? And the residents of not only this new heavens and new earth, but the capital city itself and the surrounding uh, areas. We see this in chapter 21, verses 1 to 9. We get a macro view, a huge 50,000-foot view, and with each particular chapter, we zoom in to some of the details, okay, with the chapter and verses uh, substantially. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 to 20, we talk about the description and the substance of the quality of the city, um, the walls externally, the foundation walls, the stones that build this city, the inside of the city, the substance of it, <clears throat> and, and all of the effects, as well as the quality of the glory of God shining everywhere. And we concluded by looking at this, that this was going to be glorious indeed considering that the glory of God shines and hits on everything, and you'll see lots of colors and, and just uh, auras and it, it, amazing, right? From verse 21 to chapter 22, verses 1 to 5, we talked about the city of the, quali uh, the quality of the city internally, how the river of life fro flows from the throne, and how uh, the tree of life is found within the city, and that is used uh, for therapeutic reasons, and for longevity reasons, it would, it would appear. And all of us get to partake in it. We talked about the pattern of the city, um, which I believe includes glorified Israel at the, at, this, at, 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 the, at the center of the city. At the heart of it is all of the gates with all of the 12 tribes are mentioned. And we even have the, uh, the inclusion of nations and the kings who were glorified, bringing their glory into the city itself, honoring the Lord God and the Almighty. There is no temple in the city. Uh, the Lord God, the Almighty, is the temple and the Lamb, which makes, again, I mentioned, the whole entire city itself, the Holy of Holies. Last week, we had discussed that God's glory is seen on everything and everyone that even us ourselves and those around us, there will be no night, um, not just in the city itself, but also with us as well. We will be surrounded by light all the time because the Lord will illumine us. God is now unified with all of humanity at this time 
with the Israelites and the Gentiles, there are still uh, distinctions between us, but there are not divisions between us, okay? Because we all recognize the one God. This is, again, different from the millennial kingdom, where there will be some who will recognize the one God out of compulsion and others that will recognize freely. In this time, everyone will recognize freely and acknowledge who he is. Again, there are no adversaries and Israelite challenges. Hence, the ending to this prophecy, we talked about it just ends, and that's it, right? And concluded that, that there are no issues to deal with. There are no problems. Sin is taken care of. Death is defeated. It is taken care of. There are no more enemies for Israel and, and the saints. They are taken care of. And so we will live out all of our days, all of our days in peace. It extends throughout time. Okay, let's uh, continue in our epilogue. Um, talking about the, John continues to record the words of the messenger in uh, verses, um, uh, let's see, verses six to nine. It says, and he said to me, that is, he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. This is verse six. This is the same messenger that John is talking to in Revelation chapter 21, verse 9, all the way back there. Okay? The one of the seven angels with the seven bowls. He's been with him all the way up to this point, showing him details and things like that. His his message continues. And then he uses the phrase faithful and true. Right? We talked about this, pistoi, kai, athenomoi. We talked about this, right? Faithful and true. This word is used four other times in the book of Revelation. We will not go through these. I'll just make a notation of these. The phrase is used of Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. He is called faithful and true when he returns, right? The phrase is also used for the words of God in his revelation. This is found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. If you go back especially to Revelation 19, I had mentioned that these words, faithful and true, are not just uh, words that are just thrown pell-mell. These are adjectives to describe God and who he is and the actions that he does. This phrase found in the book of Revelation highlights that not only Jesus, but his words are reliable and consistent with reality. When we read the scriptures, we are reading not just history, but reality itself. Okay? Revelation is uh, real-time future history. Genesis is real-time past history right? These are not fables or uh, stories designed for good moral behavior. These are, these words are true. They are reality. All of Jesus's prophecy from Revelation, all of it, as it was given to John, is associated with God's very nature and thus the very reality that he's uh, designed. And that will take place. John continues with an interesting phrase here in verse 6. It says, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the, the God of the spirits, the spirit of the prophets, spirits of the prophets, actually. What in the world does this mean? Well, let's take a look at a couple of things here. Here is the phrase in the Greek language. Okay. Panumaton te prophetan is the language here. 
This certain phrase that is the spirits of the prophets only occurs here in the book of Revelation. It does not occur anywhere else in the Greek scriptures. Okay? So it's unique in terms of the statement that this uh, angelic messenger is saying. The Greek word penumaton occurs 11 times in the Greek scriptures. It is plural, right? With well, um, um, genitive plural, it's possessive. And of course, it's speaking of many, right? The spirits. It usually refers to as a several. It occurs in several ways. It could used to be to refer to unclean spirits. We see this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, Mark 6, verse 7, Luke 6, 18, 7, 21, 8, 2, and Acts 5, 6. These unclean spirits translated is what this word is used here, pneumaton. Okay. It is also used to refer to, ironically enough, spiritual abilities in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. They're called spirituals, um, as it's translated. The word gifts actually um, appears later on, but, but spiritual abilities. Abilities designed essentially to manifest the spirit for the common good, to validate the message of those who are within the congregation of Corinth and those who use them. It's also used to refer to the Holy Spirit in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, okay? when it talks about the seven spirits of God. I believe that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. Okay? However, there is one interesting reference of this word panumaton found in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 12, Verses 8 and 9. This is interesting. I'll start at verse 4 or 7. It says, it is for your discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Right? Furthermore, we have earthly fathers who to discipline us or train us, and we respected them for it. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits, Panubaton here, and live? Interesting phrase. This is the same word here. The author of Hebrews concerning instruction, and instruction is not something that we, uh, uh, especially when you're young, right? You don't look forward to, but over time, you see the benefit of it as you're trained. And the author of Hebrews uh, compares earthly fathers and their intentionality to train their children with heavenly ones. How much should we subject to the father of spirits and live? What spirit is he talking about here? There's also some interesting references found in the Hebrew scriptures as well. Again, I am convinced that when the, uh, when the messenger is speaking to John, he knows exactly what he's talking about. John is not scratching his head wondering what he means. He knows exactly what he means. Because this phrase shows up in various places in the Greek scriptures as well. In Numbers chapter 16, verses 20, to 22, we read this statement. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. Concerning Korah's rebellion. But they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? The spirits of all flesh, the spirits of all those who have flesh, the men, humanity itself. In Numbers chapter 27, verses 15 to 17, just a few chapters over, it says, Moses spoke to the Lord saying, may the God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord 
will not be like sheep which has no shepherd. Again, referring to the quality of humanity. That you, the quality of humanity is both flesh and spirit. And Moses acknowledging the, uh, the, the governance and the authority of God over these individuals. In these two texts, the phrase that is used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, not inspired, but it's helpful to kind of see how the language, how they translate it from the Greek text to the Hebrew text, uses the phrase ton penumaton, the same phrase found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. So concerning the spirits of the prophets, this is talking about the individuals those whom God had called as prophets to proclaim his word concerning events regarding the future and how these things are tied to the attributes of God being faithful and true. Some notes about the prophets. Remember, they were designated by God. They were called by God. As a matter of fact, if you, if you said that you were called by God and you weren't and gave messages from God that he didn't gave that he didn't give the punishment was you got rocked to sleep right you got the old uh you know stone to the face type deal right because again prophets came in the name of the Lord for giving the word of the Lord to those whom they gave prophets again spoke the word of the Lord straight straight verbal communication by God through this individual or written out as we read in our text. Okay. Prophets did not speak on their own initiative. They didn't wake up one day and go, you know what? I think I'm going to decide to be a prophet for God today. I think that's nice, right? They were called by God to give messages to Israel and to those whom God had sent to them. The source of the message was God himself, and the purpose was to communicate his mind, his desire, his work to the people he was speaking to. Okay. All of this carried with it the weight of the authority of God himself, because they were sent by him. This is very important. So these are faithful and true these words that the messenger has given and they are backed by the spirit of the prophets the prophets whom god had sent they are underscored as as true as true indeed they are reality not fairy tales or fiction John continued to detail the transmission of this prophecy by mentioning his messenger or his angel to show to his bondservants the things that which must soon take place. Okay. This actually harkens back to all the way what was emphasized in chapter 1. John was given this prophecy by way of this messenger, and he mentions this in the introduction in revelation chapter one it says the revelation of jesus christ again notice the language this is not the revelation of john the origin of this message comes from christ himself which god gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant john who testified to the word of the Lord and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. John was given this prophecy, communicated by a messenger, given to Christ, originated by God, given to him. The source comes straight from the top. This was meant to be believed because this came from God himself. There's a lot of 
what, what others would consider to be fantastical details about Revelation. We went through them all the way from chapter one up to now. Lots of crazy things going on here. And every single instance, every single word, every single idea, every single event, every single concept is to be believed because the source comes from God himself. Urkomai Tahi is the word. I am coming quickly. We get some words from Jesus in this text. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. This statement occurs four times in the Greek scriptures. This word is translated soon or quickly, right? The Greek word is defined as speedily, quickly, or without delay. I am coming. I'm coming without delay. I'm coming rapidly, right? This word can be used in terms of a person's actions as they run quickly here and there, right? In a, in a haste to get somewhere. It can also be used as a statement of expectation, right? Especially in terms of the last things of what we've been talking about. This is to express that Jesus is uh, coming. His, uh, his appearance and these eventual prophecies are, will, be, will, will come without delay. The perspective of us should be the same. That God's appearance and all of these things can take place rather speedily and quickly. This is talking in terms of expectation. Again, we do not know when these things will occur. We do know that they will. But we do not know when, right? But nevertheless, they are coming. And they will be without any delay. There is no hindrance to these things once they happen. In verses 7 and 8, John continues to discuss and speak in his response to the messenger who was sent to him. He wrote that he fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. We read this here. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. Personal witness here to these, uh, these events that unfolded to him and the message that was sent to him. And when I heard and saw these things, I fell down at, to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and whom those who heed the words of this book worship God, right? You know, John's so funny. This isn't the first time, this isn't the first time that he's done this. <laughs> the first time he did this, he would fall down and worship at the, fall down with the uh, expectation to worship at the feet of this thing to give honor and praise to this angel is right before he sees Jesus appear in his second coming in verse in chapter 19. Verses seven and following. Concerning Israel and their unification with Christ in the millennial kingdom. John details this. He says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory because the wedding celebration of the lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. We talked about this. This is not the church. This is Israel. Israel is ready to receive their Messiah. And it has been granted to her that she be dressed in bright, clean, fine linen. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9. And he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the banquet of the wedding celebration of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Verse 10. And I fell down at his feet to worship him. It was so overwhelming for John. He just, he just forgot where he was. He decided to, to, to bow down and worship this angel who was giving him this message. And the angel says to him, do not do that. I am a fellow slave of you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. 
For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We talked about that, that we find Christ all throughout the prophetic uh, utterances of the prophets throughout the Greeks, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, as well as the Greek scriptures. In chapter 22, it is the same. John is overwhelmed at what he has saw, overwhelmed at the message that this angelic messenger has given to him. And as a result, he falls down to pay homage to this angel. And this angel again rebukes him, saying, don't do that. I'm not the one. This, this, this didn't originate from me. Right. Instead, this originated from God. Worship him. Right. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets. Right. Worship God. John, continuing in verse 10, with a messenger again from chapter 21, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Keep this open. John continued to pin the words of the messenger who was sent by God, telling him, don't seal it up. Don't hide it. Don't put it aside. Because the time is near for these things to take place. Let it open. There are parallel statements seen throughout the Hebrew scriptures as it pertains to the prophecies that are received by the individuals who get them. For instance, in Daniel chapter, 28, chapter 8, verse 26, uh, Daniel is told by the messenger concerning the visions that he's seen as it relates to the future. Keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Don't, don't share this. Just keep it. Keep it to yourself because the time isn't there yet. This pertains to many days in the future. You'll be long gone by the time these things happen. Same thing in chapter 12, verse 4 of Daniel. After Daniel, after the messenger shares with Daniel the things as it pertains to the conqueror and his conquering all of these lands and then eventually being destroyed by the Lord God, he says, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time that many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Same thing in verse nine. At the very end of the letter or at the very end of the book of Daniel, uh, he tells basically uh, the messenger tells Daniel, he's like, you know, just go ahead and just go ahead and pass away. This 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 won't concern you. Seal up these words, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Don't worry about this, Daniel. I've given it to you. This will become relevant later on, but uh, but seal up this word. Seal up these words here. Don't worry about it. But in this particular passage in Revelation 22, John is given the order not to seal this up. Why? Because the time, as in contrast to Daniel, is not is not uh, is not incessantly till the end of time, but it is soon. The time is near. Right. Now, of course, we've been waiting quite a time. But like I said before, we're not talking about chronology here, like at exactly 845, these things will take place. No, this is talking about the expectation. Now, when these things happen, they are near and they will continue. They will happen. It's after this that Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel, wrong, wrong person. John, speaking to the messenger, gives one of the most curious statements in this chapter. Perhaps even this entire book. Let's read verse 11. You kind of see, the one who does evil, let him do evil still. And the one defiled, let him be defiled still. And, and the righteous, let him practice righteousness still. And the holy, let him be holy still. What in the world does this mean? And why is it at the end? I mean, I would think it would be, you know, the beginning. But why is it at the end? 
Well, let's discuss this statement a little bit further. Let the one who does wrong. Ha adikon is the word here. This Greek word for, uh, occurs only three times in the entire Greek Testament. The third occurrence is here. There's two others. It could be translated as the unjust ones or the ones who are unjust, right? The ones who do wrong, the wrongdoers, right? Let's look at a couple of instances of uh, how this word is used and kind of get some understanding of what this is, what this means. In Acts chapter 7, verses 27, the phrase is used here. It says, but the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? The one who was injuring his neighbor is that word, ha'adikon. So one who is unjust, it would appear, and especially in Acts, is one who injures their neighbor intentionally for the purpose of destroying them, for the purpose of hurting them, perhaps maybe even trying, attempting to try to kill them, right? Or injure them severely, to put them out of commission. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 to, 30, to 25, we see this in relation to slaves and masters. It says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. For the he who does wrong is out of Kia. The one who is not just in their actions and their conduct, the one who seeks to injure a person or cause damage to a person physically, this is who he's talking about. It seems that the messenger is writing to John, speaking about a particular group of people or individuals who have their, their sole intention, their sole function to purposely injure, to harm, to destroy, to take advantage of another. So let the one who does wrong still do wrong, or do wrong still, right? This word appears only once in the entire Greek New Testament, which is kind of interesting. It is associated with adikio, as you can see. This, so, this statement is also associated with the previous statement. In other words, those who are the unjust ones do unjust things still, right? This is a, this is a, a, a statement, again, that, that speaks to one's intentions. And it appears that John is writing this, that those who do wrong still do wrong. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The one who is filthy, again, this is harafparos, uh, haraf I think so. This Greek word is only used twice in the Greek scriptures, and it's also used in a literal sense and in a figurative sense. It's used one other time, and that is within the book of James, chapter 2, verse 2. Concerning James and his his stern, strict admonishment to the Hebrew believers. It says, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes or filthy clothes, that word filthy, again, is this word here. James talking about the appearance of a person, that they were favoring the face. They were showing personal favoritism to those who were dressed in fine linen and garb, giving them the best seat in the congregation, while those who came in uh, the riffraff, looking like, uh, 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 you know, they haven't had a shower in a couple of months. 
And they would mistreat them, even to the point of uh, throwing them in jail and not treating them as brothers in Christ. Of course, this speaks literally. If a person walked in with filthy clothes, you treat them the same, right? You do not show any favoritism. This word is also used in the Septuagint, again, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, in a very most interesting place. We find this word used in Zechariah, or Zechariah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, concerning a high priest, Joshua, who has filthy garments. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing on his right to accuse him. But the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebukes you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this not a stick snatched from the fire? And Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and standing before an angel. And then we see that uh, 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 the Lord uh, exchanges those filthy garments and gives him a fresh robe and a fresh turban along with those filthy garments. He takes them off of them. So what does this mean? Does this mean that um, John is saying that uh, people have to make sure they shower? Maybe perhaps take a bath, right? Make sure you put the smell good on. Now, why are you doing that? Wisdom. Don't 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 call out people like that. That's rude. Okay? That's gonna be hung up in your bathroom, right? Let 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 uh uh one be filthy, filthy still, right? Again, be filthy still, same uh, same uh, uh voice, mood, and tense as the one before. <coughs> Again, it would seem that this word is associated with a person's status. In other words, the one who is filthy will be filthy still, right? That's kind of the idea here. So what do we got here? The unjust one, be unjust still. The one who is filthy, be filthy still. What is this talking about? What is the aspect of this text, of this passage? Why is John emphasizing it here? Well, again, this is associated with the prophecy that was given to John, all of it. The ones who were unjust and the ones who were filthy is the, one who, is the ones that he's been talking about this entire time throughout the book of Revelation. Those who take the mark of the beast, they will continue to be unjust and they will continue to be filthy. As we have heard once before, turn with me to, this is not part of my slides here, but turn with me to Revelation chapter uh, 13. I'm going to start at verse 7 and read all the way, i still got some time, to verse 19. Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. I'm sorry, um, ver, yeah, verse, verse 18, I'm sorry. says, and it was also given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. This is chapter 13, verse 7, verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world and the book of life um, of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the preservation, here is the pre perseverance and the faith of the saints. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. 
and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. If you want to know more about that, go back and uh, listen to uh, chapter 13. We uh, go through this really extensively. He performs great signs so that he even makes uh, fire come down out of heaven on the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, dwelling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He will send out individuals, those who take the beast, those who take the mark of the beast, show their allegiance to the beast and act in accordance with the nature of the beast. They end up doing unjust things, injuring the saints, uh, injuring uh, those who are of Israel, seeking to kill them, destroy them. They will be filthy still because they've given themselves over to the allegiance of the beast. That is these individuals that John is referring to in this text. These individuals who give themselves over to the conqueror, they will be ferocious. They will show no mercy or compassion to any of these saints. They will seek to kill each and every one of them and they will not stop. Again, this has to do with the people who were discussed within the prophecy of this book. For those who took the mark of the beast and worshiped him will commit atrocities that would make Stalin like a Boy Scout. And they will not stop. You cannot convince them otherwise. This is why the severity of the punishments of the wrath of God is so severe on those who take the mark because they show no mercy to anyone. <laughs> their sole focus and goal is to say is, is to give their allegiance, their life itself to the beast and ultimately the dragon. They will commit atrocities and acts against those who are against him. These are the unjust and the filthy ones, and they will make no mistake about it. They are unjust and they will be unjust and they are filthy and they will be filthy. Now, unfortunately, we can't go on because I'm out of time. We will continue our discourse into Revelation chapter 22 with the end of this uh, statement. That let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. We will talk about that next week. Let's pray. Lord, as uh, we wrap up this statement, John still has a lot of things to say. A lot of things to say concerning this particular period of time, giving us final words and thoughts of what he has seen and what the messenger has shared with him. I thank you so much again for his faithfulness and his dedication to you, that he's even honest to put the fact that he almost worshipped angels several times and was rebuked for it. And that's something that we can uh, think about and glory in because again this messenger points him back to the source of this message you thank you again so much for your word and for your truth and for the clarity that you give to us we thank you so much for who you are for what you do for it's in your son's name amen